thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, last month, uh, we started uh, the first um, webinar in this series, which uh, we talked a lot about accessible documents, how to create accessible Word and accessible Google Docs. And today we're gonna talk about um, creating accessible PowerPoint presentations and uh, uh, Google Slides as well. Um, and then I'll also give you some tips on um, how to present um, uh, slide deck information um, more accessibly as well. All right. Um, so this is our agenda. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about some tips for giving an accessible pre uh, presentation. Um, and I'll cover, you know, what you, you can do differently in person or what you can do online. Um, and then we'll transition into an overview of the characteristics of, uh, of an accessible slide deck. And then from there, um, I'll discuss specific techniques for creating accessible si slide decks using the built-in features of PowerPoint and Google Slides. Um, and this is gonna help you with creating a more accessible presentation uh, for distribution and dissemination. Then we'll review using the accessibility checker, um, and that can be used as a guide to test for accessibility. And then finally, we'll talk about steps for exporting um, a PowerPoint to PDF and maintaining those accessibility features um, that we use to build into the slide deck. Um, and then we'll have a question and answer at the end as well. Okay. So let's start off with giving uh, uh, with tips for giving an accessible presentation, um, either in person or virtually. Um, so the first step is to, to keep the content simple. Um, a good thing to remember is that you are the presentation, not the slide deck. Um, the audience is there to listen to you as the subject matter expert, not to read the contents of your slides. So your slides really should complement what you are presenting and the text on the slide really should serve as a reminder of the important points to discuss with your audience. Um, your slide deck really should be used to organize your thoughts and to emphasize those key points. You wanna make sure that the text on your slide as well as any other visuals that you're including in your deck are big enough to read. Now this may be different depending upon if you're presenting in person or if you're presenting online. So if you're presenting in person, you wanna make sure that the font is big enough to see from the back of the room. Or if you're presenting online, make sure that the text is big enough to see even on small screens like laptop screens or mobile devices. So a good guideline for minimum font size is 18 point. Um, but you may want to test this out beforehand just to make sure that that's going to uh, going to work. Um, you want to use easy to read fonts such as sans serif fonts. Um, so example of sans serif fonts include Calibri, Aptos, um, and those are actually the default font when creating PowerPoint slide decks. Um, so sans serif fonts, those are types of fonts that don't have any decoration or stroke, what are called stroke width variations. They're more minimalist without any flourish and flourishes, um, and they're much easier to read than serif fonts. Um, you also want to make sure that there's a good amount of space between the points on your slide. You don't want to cram too much information on a slide, making it challenging for participants to skim the content. And when you're presenting the information on your slides, uh, be sure to verbally describe any visual elements on the slide itself, such as graphics or images. Now, if you're including a visual element on your slide, there must be a reason for that. So be sure to explain that reason and uh, assume that some participants won't be able to see what you're describing. So, for example, um, if you're including a graph or a, ch a chart, you want to be sure to explain the important points of that chart or graph, and that helps paint a picture in the mind's eye of your audience. 
Um, when transitioning from one slide to the next, um, you want to avoid animations and automatic slide transitions as that can be distracting to viewers with photosensitivity. Um, also screen readers, they have a hard time with interpreting automatic transmission uh, transitions. They may reread those the contents of the slide or they might only read parts of it or they might not read it out at all or it could be read out of order. Um, so that's something to be aware of, especially if you're disseminating your slide deck before or after the presentation, you wanna make sure that you um, disable those kinds of slide transitions. Now, uh, Google, and, Google Slides and PowerPoint, um, they do have the ability to provide automated machine-generated subtitles and captions, um, and they can even translate the subtitles and captions in, in multiple language. And this can be accomplished uh, when setting the options in presenter mode. And you'll need to make sure that you have a stable internet connection as this is a, a cloud-based service. Now, this might be a good option when presenting in person and you'd like to provide subtitles or captions as an option, not as an accommodation. If it's an accommodation, that requires having an actual live human transcribing your speech and environmental noises. But if you wanna include it as an option, um, uh, uh, then you'd want to actually use the webinar platform um, automated captions instead of the ones that are built into Google or the ones that are built into PowerPoint. Um, the reason for this is that the audience, they can't control it on their end. They can control it if, if you, in, if you um, uh, include the, the uh, automated captions in Zoom, uh, the users can choose to turn that on or not. But if it's, uh, if it is, if it's enabled within PowerPoint or Google, then they're forced to view those subtitles and it can be uh, distracting to some audience uh, members, myself included. I usually don't have captions on. Um, and then when you're presenting, make sure to give the audience enough time to process the information that's being shared on your screen. You want to state the important points in various ways and ensuring the audience understands the concept, concepts. And this is especially important for complicated concepts, such as charts and graphs. You want to provide multiple modalities so that the audience members can take in that information. And it's always a good idea to distribute the slide deck to the audience before the presentation, and that helps ensure that assistive technology users have the opportunity to preview the information and then they can engage with the presenter um, and ask meaningful questions. Okay, uh, characteristics of an accessible slide deck. So giving an accessible presentation really starts with an accessible slide deck. Now, before I get into the techniques for creating uh, an accessible slide deck, let's talk about those characteristics. So first of all, every slide in your deck must have a title and each slide title must be unique. And we'll talk more about that and why it's important a little bit later on. Um, and then as always, you wanna make sure that your slide deck has sufficient color contrast between the text and the background so that it's easier for folks to see who may have, some, uh, who may have low vision. Um, so something to keep in, not, in mind is if you decide to use the built-in themes or designs that are included in either PowerPoint or Google Slides, you want to be aware of the color combinations that are included in those uh, pre-built-in themes or designs. They may or may not pass color contrast thresholds that are accessible for accessibility. So be, be sure to check that before you distribute your, your deck. Now, when composing your slide deck, make sure that the content is easy to see with large enough and clear fonts and easy to read or more accurately, easier to skim the information and easy to follow with a logical outline and meaningful bullet points. 
Um, if you're including acronyms in your slide deck, make sure that they're spelled out the first time that they appear on their slide. In UW, we certainly love our acronyms, so be sure that you spell those out. If you're including tables, make sure that you're presenting tabular data and that you're not using tables for layout, as it's really challenging for screen reader users to navigate information within a table. And tables, just a reminder that tables should be simple and not include split, uh, split or merged cells. Um, and make sure that your header um, or column, uh, header rows or header columns are identified. And I'll show you how to, how to do that in a little bit. Always check the reading order of the slide contents to make sure that they announce in the proper order that they were meant to be presented. And I'll talk about how to do that as well. And then any visual content added to your slide deck, such as images, graphs, charts, those must have meaningful alt text. Um, and any decorative images that are included in the deck should be marked as decorative so that screen readers don't announce them. And then finally, make sure that your deck passes an, uh, an automated accessibility check. And there is one that's built into Office 365, and we'll take a look at that um, and the inspection results of, of what an uh, accessibility report would look like um, later on in this presentation. Okay, so let's get into uh, the techniques for creating accessible slide presentations. Now, a little disclaimer, all of the uh, features uh, demonstrated here are going to be screenshots and animated GIFs. It gets a little inception-y if, um, if I demonstrate PowerPoint when I'm giving a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I wanted to, to let you know that. And uh, um, many of these uh, screenshots and animated GIFs were recorded in Office 365 um, and, um, and Google at uh, the Google Workspace. Um, so if you're using an older version of Office, it might be more challenging it, it, it actually will be more challenging to create accessible content. And some of those options will be different. And sometimes they're not available at all, depending upon the age of your version of, um, of PowerPoint. Okay, let's get into the techniques. So technique number one is to use layouts and templates. Um, so you want to make sure that you're using the built-in layouts to construct your slide deck. So slide layouts, they come with predefined slide structure, um, and that includes a title and content with the proper reading order. The slide title is usually announced first, and then the corresponding content is announced afterwards. And if you're adding any additional content to the slide using uh, the insert text box command, that's gonna affect your reading order information. And that will need to be reviewed in the final stages for checking for accessibility. And I'll, I'll go over that in a moment. Now, I mentioned earlier to be mindful when using themes and designs built into PowerPoint and Google Slides, as many of those themes offered by both Microsoft and Google, they might not pass a color, the color contrast um, thresholds. And they do need to be checked for accessibility. And also some of those designs that are included in PowerPoint, sometimes they contain icons and other graphics um, to provide a more appealing visual representation of the information. And many of those graphics do not have alt text assign and probably should be marked as decorative. So something else to, to be aware of as well. Now you might wanna consider using a PowerPoint template with branding information like the slide deck I'm using today. Um, and an accessible template is available from University Marketing and Communications and can be found um, at the link that is included on this slide deck. And um, let's see if we can get that, that uh, link in the chat as well so that you have access to that. So real quickly, I wanted to show you a screenshot of where those different layouts are um, located within PowerPoint. To access them, you go to the home ribbon and then select the layout dropdown, and then choose the option that best fits the information that you'd like to present. Um, and that must include, it must include a header, a content, and a graphic. Um, 
What I really recommend avoiding is choosing a blank slide and then using the, um, the insert text box command to add content to your slide deck uh, because that, um, that actually, uh, it takes away some of the, the, um, the important elements of that, that slide deck. Um, so the uh, the elements that are included in these layout drop downs are actually mapped to um, to uh, uh, to either heading levels or paragraphs, depending upon on what the content is or depending upon what, what the, the layout is. So um, so avoid, you know, just choosing that that blank uh, slide and then adding your own content. You want to choose the correct layout from that uh, from those options there. Uh, very similar in Google Slides, you have your uh, your layout options here, um, and then you know you can choose the right one that that works to display your correct content. And again, avoid selecting that that blank slide. Okay, technique number two: use slide titles. So for digital presentation, slide titles really are critical for accessibility. They serve as a means for providing structure, navigation, and context of the content. That's why, um, that's why I recommended not choosing a blank slide and then adding your own content, as those navigation features will be stripped away. So each and every slide must have a slide title. And if a slide title is absent, um, this is going to appear in your inspection results of the accessibility report as an error. Um, so each slide should, or each slide title should be unique, rather, um, as screen readers use slide titles to navigate by. So if you have any spillover information, you might want to consider numbering your slides, one of two, and two of two, uh, so forth and so on, to distinguish them from one another. Um, so when using slides from the layout drop-down options, um, the title slide maps as a heading level one. And then any header and content within that slide that maps um, as uh, as a paragraph style. Okay, so here we have um, an image of you know just a regular. Uh, this happens to be the, the title slide, um, and then you can just click to add um, add your information into that particular slide. And I and I wanted to show this slide because it actually shows you. Um, in the selection pane here, how this information is mapped. So um, you can see here, this is the top box, the top element here is gonna be your title. And that actually maps to a title element in the selection pane. And I'll talk a little bit more about the selection pane later on. Okay, same thing in Google Slides. Um, this is just a generic slide with content. Um, so you can click to add your title and then click to add your text there. And that title um, element at the top of this um, slide here is going to map as a heading level two. Okay, technique number three, add alt text uh, for images. So just a reminder that alt text provides context and conveys the meaning or purpose of an image. So if you don't have any alt text, Individuals who rely on screen readers to announce that information, they might miss out on critical information. Um, alt text should be short and to the point, about 140 characters or so, and that's just enough text to communicate the idea without burdening the user with unnecessarily detail. Um, simple images, those include things like photos and logos. Um, and examples of more complex images includes charts and graphs. And if you're posting your slide deck along with a recording of the presentation, you want to make sure that you audibly describe those images in your slide deck to provide the proper context. Now, any images that are purely decorative or that don't provide any additional information, those should be marked as decorative. So for example, we've got this gold bar in this um, slide right here. Um, you would want to mark that, that particular gold bar that separates the, the heading from the, the text as a decorative image. Now, PowerPoint and Google Slides have the ability to group multiple images into a single image. 
And this allows the author to assign alt text to a group of related images rather than assigning alt text to each individual image. Um, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But it's important to note that at this time, it's not possible to assign alt text to group images in Google Slides. So something to be aware of. Um, also another friendly reminder that whenever possible, you wanna use actual text, not images of text um, to create your comment or content rather. Uh, so images of text really lose fidelity when they're enlarged and it can make the text difficult to read. Um, and, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't have actual text in your slide deck instead of, um, you know, an image of text. Um, is actual text actually downloads a lot faster than images of text. Okay, so let's take a look at grouping images. Um, this, uh, this is a, an animated GIF and it's on a loop. And so uh, what I'm doing here is I am clicking on each one of these images um, to, to I, I can either actually, I can marquee all of these images or I can control click or command click. Um, and then that will select all of the images. And then from the home ribbon, I will go to um, the arrange uh, drop down menu and then I will select group. And then that's gonna flatten that image into one single image. And then from there, I can assign alt text to the entire group by right clicking on the image and then selecting view or edit alt text uh, from, uh, from the context menu. And then I can enter in my alt text for there. Okay. Technique number four, structuring tables. We talked a little bit about tables before. Um, and they're great for communicating relationships between data, especially when those relationships are, are really best expressed in a matrix of rows and columns. Now, screen reader uh, use table headers to announce column and row making, uh, column and row information. And that makes it easier for users to understand the data's organization and relationships. So if heading cells are not associated with the data cells, then the table's not formatted uh, correctly. And the screen reader user is going to get lost in, in all of that data. So it's important to note that headers and tables contribute to the semantic structure and data integrity of a document. They convey those relationships between different parts of the table. And that includes how headers relate to the data, data cells, and that ensures that the content is presented in a more meaningful way. Uh, headers facilitate table navigation for users who rely on keyboards for navigation. So with headers, keyboard users can understand the context of the table cells more easily, and then they can navigate through the table in a more logical manner. Now, I was, uh, well, preparing for this presentation, I was looking at the WebAIM site, and they mentioned that most screen readers will not identify table headers in PowerPoint, but we still recommend going through this process as it's really important to identify headers visually and support uh, for table headers in Microsoft is improving constantly. Plus, these headers will be identified if you're saving to PDF, um, you know, if you're converting from the most up-to-date version of PowerPoint. So that header information will actually convert to a PDF and screen readers can um, announce that accurately in the PDF document itself. So um, we actually tested this. We did a lot of testing last summer um, with screen readers and, and um, and uh, PowerPoint presentations and Word documents and Google, doc, uh, Google uh, documents and Google slides and PDF output. And we actually found that NVDA and VoiceOver really, they do have a hard time with tables that don't have a, a header assigned. They just announced the content without the context of the header. Now, JAWS and Narrator do a better job of interpreting simple tables that that uh, do not have a header assigned, but we really uh, want to impl 
implement or, or um, you know, stress that, you know, for consistency, it's a good practice to make sure that you are assigning table headers um, in your um, slide decks or your, your uh, documents. Uh, simple, uh, a reminder that simple tables in Office applications can be made accessible, but complex tables that are nested or if they have merged cells or split cells, those can't. And those really should be simplified for functionality and usability. So I wanted to show you um, a screenshot of a table that was included in a slide deck. And we actually um, are exposing the table design tab here. Um, and in order to do that, you would select the table itself, uh, the entire table. And when you do that, then this table design tab becomes visible. And then you can select that uh, table design tab. And then you'll see these check boxes here. Now um, I have it, um, I have it uh, kind of highlighted with this red uh, rectangle here. And uh, to indicate the header row of this table, you want to make sure that the header row checkbox is selected, and that will automatically create the heading row for this first row. Now, if this column were also going to be a header, uh, header column, then you'd want to check this, uh, this checkbox here where it says first column. So that way, um, screen readers will identify the proper data with the proper cell information. Now, banded rows, by default, banded rows will also be selected if you're incorporating, if you're including a table within your, your PowerPoint presentation. And that just allows for different colors uh, between the different um, rows within the table itself. Now, at this time, it's not possible to format tables in Google Slides. So, in, for contrast, in Google Docs, authors can pin the top row of a table and that acts as a table header. But that functionality isn't available right now when including tables in Google Slides, unfortunately. Okay, technique number five, use meaningful hyperlinks. Now, PowerPoint and Google Slides automatically create a link when an author adds a URL to a slide and that makes it clickable. So for distributing a digital slide deck, you might wanna consider including meaningful hyperlinks rather than listing the URL, which usually has a long string of letters and characters and isn't really helpful for you know, telling the user where that link is gonna go. But using meaningful hyperlinks, that provides more clear and concise information about the link and then where that content um, is, or where that link is probably going to take them. And it helps the user know something a little bit more about the destination of that link. Now, screen reader users sometimes navigate documents using the tab key, and that's how they jump between links, buttons, and other interactive elements in a document or um, in, a, in a slide deck or even on a web page or they can generate a list of links and navigate them in, uh, in the order uh, that they appear in the deck, or they can sort them alphabetically. Now, when they land on a link, the screen reader will announce link, and then it's gonna read the link text. Now, if you're creating a presentation that is intended to, uh, to be displayed both electronically and in print, you might want to include that URL and a description um, in the link text. And I've included an example uh, here on this slide that has um, an example of meaningful link text. And then we have the URL um, that is included in parentheses, but it is not clickable um, because that's a duplication of this link. So you don't want to duplicate that. You only want to have one instance of um, this meaningful link text if you're going to distribute this um, electronically. But having that, uh, this uh, URL will also make it easier for people who are attending the presentation to, uh, to know what, what that link is and then they can look at it or, or they can visit it in real time if they decide. And then I've also included just a brief um, description of where that link is going to take the user. Okay, and then to create um, uh, meaningful hyperlinks um, in, in slide decks, 
uh, in Google Slides or in PowerPoint or um, even in Word or, or um, Google Documents. You just highlight that text and then right click it. And then from the context menu, there should be a, a hyperlink option. And that's going to open up a new window in there. You would uh, you would enter in the information there. OK, technique number six, add a document title. So uh, document titles are typically the first content that is announced by a screen reader when a new electronic document is loaded. So adding document properties, this allows screen reader users to get a little bit more information about the, the slide deck without the need to open it. They can just call up that information. And a document title provides users with a clear and concise way to identify the content and the purpose of the slide deck. Now for screen reader users, this can save time by limiting the need to open a slide deck and then to go through some of the slides to figure out if it's actually the one they're looking for. Because they rely on document titles to navigate and understand the structure of a document. So adding a document title, a summary and keywords that can improve search engine rankings. And it also makes the slide deck more discoverable if it's hosted from a website. So consistent use of document titles, that contributes to a better user experience and that helps users recognize and associate content with a specific source or an organization. Document title provides context and users benefit from having a clear and meaningful title that prepares them for the information presented within that document. And also document titles are required for accessibility. So if that information is missing, it will be flagged in an accessibility report. So to add a document title um, in PowerPoint for Mac, um, you would go to the file dropdown and then select properties and then click on the summary tab. So here you can see you can add the title, you can add the author, um, and you can also add um, keywords and then additional comments as well. It's a little bit different process when you're adding that metadata in uh, PowerPoint for Windows. To do that, you go to the File tab and then select Info. And then you uh, select, um, when you do that, this is, at the, this is the properties um, information here. When, when you select Info, it's actually, um, it's collapsed. So there will be a link there that says show all properties. And if you select that links, link, it's going to expand this properties uh, window. And then from here, you can see there is a title. And then you can also add tags and comments. Um, and then the author information is usually um, um, pre-filled in uh, depending upon you know, your, your particular version of um, of PowerPoint, but uh, um, you can also change the author from here as well. For Google Slides, it's a little bit different to include the, the document title. Uh, that is actually, there's a text field in the upper left-hand corner of Google Slides. And when you hover your mouse over that, uh, that text field, um, it actually comes, it's a, it's a, this is a terrible name for a tooltip. It just says rename. But really what this is, this is the document title field uh, for, um, for Google Slides. So that's where you'll add your, your document title there. Okay, uh, technique number seven, check, checking your reading order. I talked about um, the importance of this um, earlier. So we're gonna get into this a little bit more. So movement through slide contents that really should follow a logical order, right? When you're reading it, you're gonna read from top to bottom. Top to bottom. Um, and screen reader users should have that same experience. It should mirror the visual order of the page. So users who navigate by keyboard using the tab key, they have an expectation to move sequentially from left to right and top to bottom um, through the focusable elements on the slide. Now, logical structure, that helps with navigation and conveys the relationship between the different parts of the content on the slide, while structural elements such as slide titles and lists provide context and hierarchy. Now, this aids all users in understanding how their information is organized and related. 
Screen readers can read the elements of a slide in the order they were added. And this may be different from the order in which things appear visually on the screen. So when using slide layouts as I prescribed, screen readers will announce the slide title first, followed by the content um, in the elements that is defined in the slide layout. And then it will read any additional content on the slide in the order it was added to the slide. So when you're creating PowerPoint presentations or Google Slides, authors can, not Google Slides, I'll take that back, only PowerPoint presentation, authors can review and they can confirm the structure of the textual content of a slide by looking at the outline view of a slide deck. The other way to do this is to look at the selection pane. So I'm gonna advance it here and we're gonna take a look at the selection pane. We have another animation here. Um, so I mentioned before that the selection pane is going to show you all the different elements on the slide itself. So to access the selection pane from the home remit, you would go to the arrange drop down menu and then choose selection pane. And that's gonna pop out on the right hand side there. And now something that you wanna take into consideration, this is really important. When you are reviewing the information um, in the selection pane, the order of the, the contents is going to be in reverse. So the, the title of your slide is going to appear at the bottom of that selection pane, and that's actually going to be announced first. And then next, the contents of the slide is going to be presented. So it's gonna go in reverse order from bottom to top. Now, if you've ever, any, if you've ever done any, uh, worked in any layout applications such as Power, not PowerPoint, um, Photoshop, this is similar to layering. So you've got your, your layer, your bottom layer is actually the first thing that you add to your Photoshop document. And then anything that you add is just going to layer on top of that. So it's kind of a similar situation. Now, this uh, way of, of reviewing the, the reading order using the selection pane will work in um, uh, Mac and Windows for, for PowerPoint, either online or desktop. But there is another way to check the reading order as well. But this is on, this only works for uh, Windows only um, in the, the desktop application itself. There is a reading order panel, and that is um, included in the review tab, or, or rather you can access it by going to the review tab. And then on that, that ribbon for the review tab, you'll see a check accessibility drop down option. And then from there, you can select reading order pane. And that is also going to open up on the right hand side. Now, you're going to notice that it, it looks similar, but there is one major difference. The reading order pane actually um, organizes the information from top to bottom, so which makes a lot of sense, right? So, um, so you can clear, clearly see here um, the reading order panel. We've got the title that is included in the top of this list. And then we have a content, which is right below it. And then we have um, an image, which is just below that. So it's important to know which way you are reviewing the reading order of your slide content. If you're using the selection pane, the order is gonna be reversed bottom to top. If you're using the reading order panel in PowerPoint for Windows only desktop, then it's gonna be from top to bottom. I also wanted to show a, um, a screenshot of outline view within PowerPoint. And this gives a really easy to view, uh, bird's eye view of the, the, the information within your PowerPoint presentation itself. Um, slide titles will be in bold and then the content will, will not be bolded. So it shows really clearly um, all of the information that is included in your PowerPoint presentation. Now, I wanted to show you this image here because um, it's not possible to control reading order in Google Slides. There is not a way to show the different elements within your Google Slide um, 
or I'm sorry, there is not a way within Google Slides to show the different slide elements in your slide deck itself. But if you create something, if you create a Google Slide deck in Google Slides, and then you export that to PowerPoint, you can check the read order by using the selection pane or the reading order panel, but the elements are going to be named quirky things. So, um, so this is the screenshot that I wanted to show you. So in this particular example, um, we had created a slide deck in Google Slides and then we exported it to PowerPoint. And each one of those elements showed up as a Google shape semicolon with some number, semicolon, the letter P, and then another number. So it's really challenging to know which element is a slide title, is the content, or an image, because they're all just named different Google shapes. Now you can select each one of those and it will highlight in your PowerPoint present or in yeah, in the PowerPoint presentation whether or not it's a slide title or whether or not it's content or a graphic. And then you can rename it. Um, but it's really hard to know if someone has just chosen a blank slide and then added text boxes. And remember, if you're adding text boxes, those don't have anchor points um, for navigation. So it's really hard to know if those elements are actually true slide elements or if they're just text boxes. So a little bit more challenging um, when you're working in Google Slides. Technique number eight, use an accessibility checker. So document accessibility checker, those are automated tools and those can really help with validating the technical accessibility of a slide deck and, in, uh, and its content, contents. And in some cases, they, they may provide feedback and guidance on how to fix uh, any issues that appear in that accessibility report. Um, accessibility checkers, they verify the deck against a set rule um, that identifies possible issues that could cause barriers to accessibility. And using this accessibility checker can help authors to quickly identify those types of barriers and help streamline the overall workflow. Now, accessibility reports help authors understand the nature of the problems and provides recommendations for reducing any barriers to information. And in many jurisdictions, there are legal requirements and regulations related to digital accessibility. So using accessibility checkers helps ensure compliance with these kinds of laws, and that helps reduce the risk of legal issues and helps ensure that digital documents are accessible to everybody. Um, accessibility checkers can serve as educational tools um, by helping raise awareness about digital accessibility best practices, excuse me, and also by highlighting any potential issues um, and then offering guidance uh, to learn how to design more accessible slide decks in the future. Um, so I mentioned before, an accessibility checker is built into Office 365, and I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. But um, Google does not. Um, unfortunately, they don't have a built-in accessibility checker, but there is a third-party plugin called Grackle that helps fill that gap. Now, at this time, Grackle products can't be included in the UW instance of the Google Workspace due to some security concerns, but that may change as Grackle has made significant improvements to their security. So stay tuned, we're, um, we're evaluating that um, and Grackle may be available to us in the future. So I wanted to take a look at um, an, uh, an accessibility inspection results. But first of all, if you want to run an accessibility report, you would go to the review tab and then from the, the review tab ribbon there, you, there will be an option for check accessibility, and that will open up um, an accessibility report on the right-hand side, as we see in this image here. So um, any issues that are included in your accessibility report are going to be categorized into either errors, warnings, or tips. Um, anything that is listed as an error, as an error will pose a barrier to accessibility and, and will need to be addressed. 
Now, any warnings could be potential blockers of accessibility and should be reviewed. Um, and then sometimes you'll get some tips that will help improve the accessibility overall. Now, the nice thing about the built-in accessibility checker in Office 365 is if you select any one of these issues that appear in your inspection results, it will take you directly in the deck where that um, barrier is located and will help you identify it and, and fix it directly. And then you might also notice that towards the bottom of the inspection results, um, it gives you information as to why you'd want to fix that, why that's a barrier to, to accessibility, and then it will give you specific steps for, for fixing those as well. So really nice way to, to help um, improve the accessibility of your PowerPoint presentations. Converting to PDF. So let's say you, you're starting off with an accessible PowerPoint slide deck um, and you want to export that to PDF. So the goal um, when exporting that to PDF is to do that in, in the way that maintains the structure, which includes the slide titles, any alt text uh, for grouped or single images, and any markup that um, explicitly identifies lists or tables or other content that's important for accessibility. What PDF does well is it preserves the layout of a slide deck for viewing and for printing. Um, and includes images and the typeface. And it also includes any interactive features such as hyperlinks. Um, and those are coded for accessibility to enhance navigation and usability for screen reader and keyboard users. Now, exporting PowerPoint to PDF from Windows applications um, preserves the accessible elements that were included in the slide deck. However, if you're exporting PowerPoint to PDF from the Mac application, the Mac desktop application, it does not produce a tagged document and that should be avoided. So if you're using a Mac and you wanna export your PowerPoint presentation to PDF, what I recommend is that you log into PowerPoint online and then use, uh, use the save as download as PDF feature, and that will produce a tagged PDF slide deck. Now, also exporting a PDF document uh, with tags from Google Slides, that's not supported at this time. So you can't create a tagged um, slide deck from Google Slides. Now, Grackle Docs, or Grackle Slides rather, that it does help with that. But again, uh, we don't have access to that on our UW instance, so stay tuned for that. Um, now, in Windows, if you're using the commands save as or export to PDF, those will create a, a, a PDF document with tags. Um, and when using the export to PDF option in Windows, you want to make sure that any, um, any checkboxes that mention um, document structure tags for accessibility is checked. So I wanted to show you what, what I mean by that. So on this next slide, um, I actually have a screenshot of the options window when, uh, when you're selecting export to PDF from Windows. So there is another option there, and this is checked by default. So uh, there is an option for document structure tags for accessibility. This is checked by default. But if you are compressing um, or if you're saving your uh, or converting your, your PowerPoint presentation to, P, to PDF and you're compressing it during the process, sometimes it unchecks this option. So you want to make sure to go back into options and check that. Okay, so just a little bit more about what makes a PDF accessible. Um, well, I talked a lot about um, tags. So how do tags relate to accessibility? So a key part of making PDFs accessible is, is, is ensuring that those that, that PDF document has tags. A tag PDF is a type of PDF that includes the underlying tag tree, which is similar to HTML, and that defines the structure of the document. Um, PDF tags make it possible to identify content as headings, lists, tables, uh, alt text for images, and so on. So without those tags, none of those accessibility features um, are going to be available. So um, 
let's see. Uh, unfortunately, not all PDFs are automatically tagged and many document authoring tools, they're not capable of creating a tagged PDF. So I mentioned that Microsoft Word and PowerPoint can export a tagged PDF on the Windows side, not necessarily on the Mac side, uh, but most other authoring uh, tools do not, including do Google Docs and Google Slides, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so let's take a look at a tag tree. Oh, actually, let me talk a little bit about um, compliance. So um, according to the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, PDFs are actually, they're officially recognized as web content um, under uh, WCAG or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And PDFUA is an additional set of those standards and that focuses exclusively on creating more accessible PDFs. And that's based off of WCAG itself. So PDFUA is an international organization, international organization, <laughs> organizational standard. And the UA part is an acronym that means universal accessibility. And this is the standard that defines the, the requirements um, for accessibility of PDF documents. Now, the only way to tell if a PDF document is PDF UA compliant is to run an accessibility report with a third party application called PAC 2024. And that's available to anyone uh, to download for free um, and use in the Windows environment. Um, the PAC 2024 checker is managed by the PDF Association. And I've also included a link to that product um, at the end of this presentation. And we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and this, the uh, PAC 2024 checker, it does provide a report about the accessibility of the PDF uh, document itself and it lists any errors that it encounters, but it doesn't give the author the ability to correct those errors. That has to be accomplished by a PDF remediation software such as Adobe Acrobat Pro. Um, and as, as always, um, if possible, you wanna test your PDF document, your exported PDF document with the screen reader to verify its usability itself. So let's take a look at the tag tree um, of a PDF document that was exported from PowerPoint itself. So um, on the right-hand side, you can see I have um, the accessibility tags are exposed. And in the center of the screenshot here, you can see the content of the slide deck itself. Now, each slide is contained within its own section tag. And within its own section tag, then you can see the hierarchy of the slide contents itself. So in this particular case, the slide title is um, mapped as a heading level two. And then we have our list here. And then we have an additional paragraph with what looks to be like some, some French content there. So it organizes things very nicely and will be announced uh, accurately by uh, screen readers or other assistive technologies. Okay. So lastly, I wanted to share some resources with you. We have uh, more information on creating accessible PowerPoint presentations from our website. Um, and then I've also included a link here to WebAIM, which also has some really good information on creating accessible PowerPoint presentations, as well as giving um, uh, presentations. You know, what else can you do to, to, um, to present your, your information more accessibly? And then I also have a link here to the PAC 2024 checker that will check your PDF documents against PDF UA. So with that, I am going to open it up uh, for questions and uh, see if anybody has any questions about any of the techniques that I mentioned today or anything um, that was covered during the presentation. It doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat. Okay. Well, that is okay. Um, if there are any questions, if you have any questions that come up, you know, maybe you're laying in bed at night and you're and you think, oh my gosh, I really wish I had asked Gaby that questions. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to add my email to the chat. 
um, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, and go over anything in, in more detail as well. So thanks again for attending today and have a great rest of your day.